I think we could probably make a show every uh, every two or three days with all this crazy shit going on. <laughs> Indeed. What is going on, man? Um, yeah, we put out a piece this morning called Don Jerome, where we uh, we uh, compared the, the events of the past week to the epic final act of The Godfather, where Michael Corleone takes care of all of the family business in one fell swoop. And it felt like that, especially on Sunday, when we saw this almost matter of fact Oh, by the way, we shut down Signature Bank um, as a throwaway paragraph in a Fed press release about the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank. And um, it, lest anyone had any doubt what this was all about, a headline just crossed as we started to hit record here that um, one of the conditions of buying Signature from the FDIC will be that the buyer ceases all crypto activities. And so that was very clearly a, um, a shot across the bow against the crypto world, um, which is something we had, you know, predicted and warned about for many years. Of course, not alone. Many people thought the same thing, but to see that play out so brutally and so coldly in black and white uh, and the speed with which both of the major payment rails into the crypto universe were blown up. The analogy is sort of like what happened to the Nord Stream 2 pipelines. You know, you wake up one day and they're, they're blown to smithereens. And so it's been fascinating. Well, it's quite interesting because it's also happening over here in the UK at the same time. Um, so I've just got up here, NatWest limits cryptocurrency transfers over scam fears. Uh, I know that I, I got an email from Gemini saying they've moved banking partner. I know Binance paused theirs uh, as well. So it's not only happening in the US, but it's starting to feel coordinated over here as well. I, I don't know if you've seen this UK stuff. Yes, we're following it closely. And um, we sort of envision a world where, uh, you know, the U.S. dollar-based system, which we would wrap, you know, um, the five eyes countries in Europe into that U.S. dollar-based system, will potentially, I guess, operate a, a ring-fenced-in, KYC, AML-compliant universe of crypto. But um, th that presents some challenges. I'm, I'm not so sure. You know, another headline uh, earlier this week was Fidelity is up and running, you know, in the U.S., of course. But imagine if you're going to be interacting with somebody like Fidelity, you're pretty pretty well uh, cleansed from a KYC AML perspective. And so I, I don't know, this is really fascinating. We, we, our piece today was a little speculative to be sure, but um, that's kind of when you have a, a blog, why not speculate once in a while? But it, it does pose some interesting questions, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, it, it, it does seem coordinated for sure. Yeah, and I, uh, I put out a little tweet uh, before this, which almost kind of like inspiration for the chat we're going to have. I, I was Googling Credit Suisse's scandals because it actually came up on the radio today. It had nothing to, do, nothing to do with crypto. They didn't even mention that. But on the radio when I was driving back uh, earlier today to come and, uh, and do this interview, they were talking about their scandals. They mentioned Mozambique and money laundering and spinal staff, uh, human trafficking. They've got clients of human traffickers, uh, Venezuelans who've looted the country, um, yeah, and just just a long list of fraudulent uh, clients they have or fraud they've been wrapped up in. And now they're obviously in a, well, they're calling it a liquidity crisis, but whatever, they're, they're in financial difficulties and they're immediately awarded a $44 billion lifeline. Whereas Bitcoiners who really are quite happy with just buying their Bitcoin and holding it are treated like they are the criminals here. Well, when you're done Googling Credit Suisse, you can Google Deutsche Bank. And um, and see, you know, I raise you a Deutsche Bank because when you want to talk about basically a criminal enterprise, in my view, um, with the amount of uh, the amount of money laundering that goes through these banks, it, it has to be that it is done knowingly. So it, it is a, a fascinating and I think a very legitimate critique of of these activities, and that's why we call the piece Don Jerome because it's not like the authorities cracking down are the uh, the uh, the angels of goodness here. You know, this is basically one more powerful mob family cracking down on people who've gone off of their uh, their desired path. And so um, it, it seems to be, look, look at JP Morgan with all of the whole Epstein scandal. And, and you know, what, they just sued a former top, top executive trying to pin the blame for JP Morgan having enabled all of this uh, illicit activity uh, on him, on that one particular person, as though the rest of the bank isn't involved in risk management somehow. And, and so it is certainly a double standard. Um, we, we never doubted that it would be. Uh, but at the same time, as we said in the piece, broadly speaking, most Americans, if the U.S. says this is illegal and the banks forbid them from engaging in it, they won't. And so you will lose the the median citizen. Um, it'll just be like, 
um, we're no coiners because it just, you know, um, it, it just, we, we have, you know, a good life and, and assembled some wealth and happiness and we would be um, willing to protect that and, and the juice isn't worth the squeeze for us. It is for many and for many of your listeners and we're not criticizing that. But for the median American or, or Brit, when presented with the hassle of having to fight for a bank account's existence versus just ignoring a complete asset class, they will choose to ignore that asset class in our view. Well, look, listen, Doomberg, whether you guys hold Bitcoin or not, and I hold Bitcoin, as, as you would expect to know, we're still on the same side of this in that we both recognize the ills of uh, central banks and what's happening within these fraudulent uh, commercial banks. We both see everything that's happening is unfair. Um, I don't think you would agree with, certainly, I don't think you would agree with Bitcoin being uh, choked out away as an option for people. So we can be entirely on the same side of this. But when you mention these uh, medium people that you might lose, one of my difficulties is, is I'm like you, I'm spending all day on Twitter reading about these things, reading your articles when they come in my inbox, reading things from Lynn Alden. When I try and step outside my like daytime work circle into my friendship groups, I'm always struggling to try and explain this without sounding like some kind of nutter or conspiracy theorist. Because <laughs> I think my friends think I'm crazy, and you know I will show them things like the office of bunch of uh, office of budget responsibility in the UK. I'll show them how much money the government is overspending and. You know, why this may be one of the reasons that we have issues with uh, inflation. I will talk to them about uh, you know, uh, criminals uh, within banks, you know, using banks to launder money. And then when I bring up Bitcoin, they're like, nah, no, Pete. Yeah. And so I have a real struggle with communicating this in a way that p- people actually take it as seriously as I think they should. So it's fascinating that you should say that, Peter, because we had this conversation uh, in the office earlier this week. So the, the editor-in-chief of Doomberg has decided to take an extended holiday from Twitter. Hmm. And the world from that vantage point is completely different than the world they had experienced in the years and months before that, you know, because Twitter has the, dissolved into sort of a even greater toxic cesspool than it has been. And it can be difficult to be on Twitter. But when you live in the Twitterverse like we do, because we're, we, you know, we, our livings depend on being connected and you know, um, uh, connecting dots quickly and seeing information, you know, as it, as it is made available. The, nobody cares. No. So, like, we were, we were specifically talking about the context of the, uh, whether or not bank contagion because of Silicon Valley Bank and, of course, Signature and Silvergate. And now it looks like First Republic is in a spot of bother, to steal a, a British phrase. Um, we, we, we speculated that if we went to our grocery store and asked five people, I asked 100 people about Silicon Valley Bank, and no, no more than five would have ever heard of it still today. And so um, there is a phenomenon for sure that when you are entrenched in the Twitter universe, the algorithm is designed to make you feel like there's always a mania somewhere. There's always a panic somewhere. That, that's what drives the dopamine, which drives the engagement. And so I, I concur. Like um, the vast, the, the median citizen in the UK has a, distant and probably slightly negative view of Bitcoin as being, quote, off limits or nefarious. Um, and they just haven't spent the time thinking about it as we have. They don't, they're not afraid of the government. People still trust the government, strangely enough. Um, and it, like if they're, they're worried about you know, um, making the mortgage payment and how the price of eggs is hurting their budget, then they're, they're not really pondering the sort of root causes of those things because to go there can lead to some pretty ugly answers, as, as we both know. Well, th- listen, the last five, six years of doing this, like an onion, I've been shedding my layers of uh, uh, supporting democracy and believing it's the best choice we have and you know, underst- like trying to make out that, look, I understand politics is messy and dirty, but democracy is great. I think I shed the final skins this last week or so where I was just like, I'm fucking done with this. And we can take Bitcoin out of the equation, Doombo. We can take it completely out of the equation. And I know when my friends like that you say the price of eggs. I mean, I've got real world numbers. Um, look, it's going to sound very privileged to explain this next point, but but just it is relevant. My kids go to a school which I have to pay for. You know, I work hard to put them in there. Every year they put up the fees three, four percent. Yesterday I got a letter saying they're up eleven and a half percent the school fees. Um, that's going to affect a bunch of people. A lot of people. Like my dad sent me to good school. He had worked every hour he could to do that. You've got. Uh, 
uh, a bar I'm trying to buy at the moment. The electricity and gas price is about to tr- triple because I've been on a long-term contract. Um, every single thing, whether it's refuse, uh, drinks, everything is going up. I know people are experiencing this and feeling the burn, but when I even try and help them connect those dots as to why it's happening, there's this kind of like aversion to going down that rabbit hole and 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 all the. And I think I know what will happen is we'll have a general election in two years and they'll change who they vote for. Yeah, and the same shit will happen. Yeah. So first of all, what does it say about our society where you have to pre-apologize for? talking about the fact that you've worked hard and have been able to do your best to provide uh, an excellent education for your children at your own expense. But I digress. Um, I'll give you an example where nobody escapes here in the United States, which is um, the Obamacare healthcare exchange networks. Um, As, you know, small business owners, uh, we don't, you know, we're not part of some corporate health plan. I know in the UK, of course, you have uh, the national healthcare system, but in the U S it's, it's, you know, uh, a perverted version of capitalism in the sense that um, you have to go into an open market and purchase it, but really it's an oligopoly. And um, since we've started our firm, um, our healthcare costs have compounded at 12% annual, long before inflation was a thing. And um, our, our, um, you know, the amount you have to pay before the coverage kicks in just keeps growing and growing and growing. You know, the deductible. The deductible, so, yeah. Yeah. Like, so um, for a family of four, in the United States, you're looking at basically on average $1,500 a month before anything kicks in and a $10,000 deductible. That's like the, basically the catastrophic plan. Jesus. And, and it only goes up from there. And so the average you know, person is out of pocket $18,000 in premiums and $10,000 deductible. So really before you get anything meaningful, you have to cough up 28 grand. And, and by the way, uh, I have a you know, relative dealing with, uh, with, with, with cancer and, and been helping, um, here and there over the years. And the, um, the, the, the bills at these hospital stays, if you actually look at the sort of the list price, um, it's just astronomical. And so, you know, you, you, you might twist a knee and be out 28 grand before you have to put out any, you know, it, it's just really staggering to me, um, that, you know, the, the pressure on that average person. Right. And so, in a way, it explains why they're sort of the distracted, too distracted by the tactical needs of the day to think about the strategic consequences of how we got here and where we're going. Well, the the squeeze is everywhere at the moment, and it's quite. We had our budget this week in the UK. I don't know if you followed the budget. Um, I mostly ignored it because I knew there was nothing in there that was going to change my life and make it better. I do know corporation tax is already going up, which is something that's going to squeeze my business more today. I had to deal with a, a pension issue that somebody you know, needs a pension, so I have to contribute to that. But there's a constant squeeze on my business. There's this constant squeeze on individuals. This constant squeeze happens. But at no point of this budget did anyone come out within the government and said, yeah, we're going to reduce the size of government. We're going to uh, reduce taxes. This is what we think will be a good way of stimulating the economy. It was everything was done with taking more money off them that they think they can distribute in a better way to stimulate the economy. And I'm just like, look, this is bullshit. I know how to deploy capital better than you. And you're taking it away from me and you're making it harder for me on every business I have. Yet you as an institution continue to grow. Yeah, in the in the U.S. again, it, it's it's something like forty plus percent of the economy now represents local, state, and federal expenditures, and um, and and our analogy is this is a, a giant game of Jenga, and there's only so many bricks from the bottom that you can take to put on top before the whole edifice collapses. Now, how close we are to that remains to be seen, um, but it does seem like we're reaching unsustainable levels. You know, Washington D.C in the U.S. compared to the rest of the country is this garden of opulence um, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, um, the concentration of millionaires in Washington, D.C. would shock you. Um, And it's all basically lobbyists and former politicians, um, you know, um, raping the public basically for ill-gotten gains. And, um, And as long as you pay off the right politicians and so on. And look, forever thus, I suppose, if you go back and look at headlines in the 50s and 60s, you would see similar things, but that was back when the size of government was 20%. <laughs> and now that it's 40 or 45%, it's becoming a real cancer. And Biden's latest budget is talking about raising the capital gains tax from you know low 20s to high 30s, uh, nearly doubling the capital gains tax, which again punishes entrepreneurs. And, um, and so, you know, it, 
it's frustrating to watch it. I mean, if you want to talk about broken politics, I mean, come to the U.S. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really amazing. And I had somebody reach out to me from, um, from the uh, former East Germany when we wrote this piece about, again, uh, crypto, which we started with poker, you know, um, called Pandora's Precedent. Yeah, great article. And, uh, and this person said, um, you know, I'm reminded of, um, you know, before the wall came down about how as things got worse, citizens retreated to the comfort of their own home garden. You know, like you created a local environment that was peaceful, that you could be happy in, and you did your best to close your brain to what was going on outside. And uh, she said that your article makes me suspect that uh, this is beginning to happen in places like the U.S., where, you know, we have all of these tropes about freedom and all this stuff. But in reality, um, you know, good luck trying to get a lot of U.S. dollars out of the U.S. dollar system if you wanted to move somewhere. Like it, it, we talk about capital controls in China. Um, you got the exit tax. <laughs> you got the exit tax and, um, and so on. And, and so, you know, it's. I guess, you know, there's got to be some silver lining in here somewhere, and I'm sure we'll find it over the next few minutes. But uh, it, it is, it, it does seem like things are coming to a head.